Well, welcome to North Shore. I am so glad you're with us today. And I want to start with a question for each of you. Have you ever had a disagreement with another person? When Nina and I got married, we ran into a number of disagreements, especially in those first few months. Who would do what around the house and when we would see our respective friends and what TV shows we would watch. But one of the biggest disagreements that year was around the arrangement of the furniture in our bedroom. Now, let me preface this story by saying it was not a large bedroom. We had a queen size bed, a dresser, and two little bedside tables that basically took up the entire room. Another key detail in the story is that I'd been living in this house for seven years with the exact same furniture in that room for seven years. So I had already tried every possible configuration of furniture. I moved the bed to each wall. I had relocated the dresser. I even made a miniature layout of the room with little pieces of paper furniture cut to scale so I could assess every possible scenario. And yes, I've gotten counseling for that. But all that is to say, by the time Nina and I got married, I had long since found the perfect arrangement that maximized the square footage and was the most pleasing to the eye. And it had remained that way for about six years, 11 months, three weeks, and a few days. So you can imagine my response when my beautiful new bride said, why don't we try rearranging the furniture in the bedroom just to see if we like it another way? And I remember pausing to think about how to best respond to this innocent but totally unnecessary question. So I said something to the effect of, honey, I love you but you are six years and 11 months too late. The work here has been done. This furniture has been redeemed to its proper pr place already. So there's no need to move it. And I was expecting her to follow with words of praise and thanksgiving. Oh, what good news. The price has been paid. I'm so glad we don't have to move this furniture again. That's not what she said. In fact, over the next few days, she continued to lovingly suggest we move the furniture. And so each time, I reminded her of all the history and all the facts until the fourth or fifth time when she actually started to cry. And I was so confused. To me, it was so cut and dry. I had tried every other arrangement, and this was the right one. So I decided to talk to a friend about it, someone who'd been married for more than a few weeks. And I walked him through the story, and he just started laughing. And he said, Scotty, I love you. And I want to affirm that you're going to be a great husband someday. You're just not a very good one yet, which made me feel a little defensive. So I said, what do you mean I'm not a very good one yet? And he said, because you missed the point of the conversation entirely. The point is not the arrangement of the furniture. The point is the relationship with your wife. And then he said something I will never forget. He said, Scotty, when it comes to your marriage, you can be right and still be wrong. In other words, you can have all the facts and all the data and all the historical evidence you want, but if you're not willing to love, if you're not willing to see the world through her eyes, if you can't make room for who she is, you may be right about the room, but you're wrong in your marriage. And that was a turning point for me in our marriage because I realized that loving Nina is more important than just being right. So I went back home and we rearranged the furniture and we had a blast moving things around and trying out a new configuration. Did we end up keeping it her way? Of course not. We moved it back a few weeks later. Why? Because I was right. I haven't been right since, but I was right in that moment. Here's the thing. You can be right and still be wrong. You can have all the answers, still miss the point. You can know the deepest truths of the universe and still not get it. How? If you lack love. And this isn't just a helpful principle for marriage. This is fundamental to the way God designed human beings to live. Someone once asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment, the most important rule of life? And Jesus said, love God and your neighbor. Before he was crucified, Jesus gave his disciples what he called a new commandment. Anyone remember? Love one another. And then when he told them how the rest of the world would be able to tell if they were his disciples, he said it will be because of love. One of those disciples, a man named John, said that if we love, it means we know God. And if we don't love, it means we don't know God. Because, and these are John's words, God is love. The writer of Hebrews said we should spur one another on towards love. Peter once said our love should be sincere and come from the heart. 
Paul prayed that our love may abound more and more to the point that we do everything in love. And if we're blessed to know the truth, if we happen to find ourselves in the right, so to speak, Paul says to speak the truth in, any guesses? Love. Why? Because love never fails. Anyone else notice a pattern in all this? Love never fails. And today, I'm going to challenge you to decide if you actually believe that or not. And not just when it comes to how you arrange the furniture, but how you engage in politics. If you're just now joining us or you've missed the last few weeks, we're in this series called Focus, how to follow Jesus when everything's political. And I can't think of a week uh, in in our lives that's going to feel more politicized and polarized than this one. Election Day is just two days away. And here's a little secret about our church that you may not know. Some of you have or will vote for Donald Trump. Some of you have or will vote for Joe Biden. But here's the deal about our church family. Regardless of who you vote for, you are welcome here at North Shore. Because with Jesus, everybody was welcome. Remember, Jesus called a tax collector named Matthew who supported the Roman occupation. And he called a zealot named Simon who was fighting against the Roman occupation. You couldn't find more politically opposite people and Jesus turned them into roommates. So what we ask of everyone in our church, regardless of how you vote, or how you will vote, is that we would all strive to keep the life and teaching of Jesus at the center of everything we say and do. That you would seek to view politics through the lens of scripture rather than looking at scripture through the lens of your politics. And that you would be humble and prayerful as you seek to discern how to honor God, not just with your vote, but with your life. But the fact that our community is politically diverse means two important things. One, next Sunday, if we know the results by next Sunday, some of you may feel vindicated and relieved, while others of you may feel heartbroken, even scared. I remember during the last election, walking into church on Sunday, and it was like the room was emotionally torn in two. You could feel a sense of triumph on one side and almost tragedy on the other. And that's something we're going to have to navigate together as a church. And that's what I'm going to be teaching on next Sunday. So if there's any Sunday you shouldn't miss in this series, it's actually the next one. So make sure you join us next Sunday. But the second implication that comes out of the political diversity in our community is actually an opportunity. You see, in this hyper-polarized and hyper-partisan world in which we live, We have an opportunity to show the world that the church of Jesus isn't a particular wing of a particular political party. It's an entirely new kind of community that changes the world through an entirely new kind of power. But to get there, we have to start by acknowledging the fact that like the rest of the world, when it comes to policies and political ideologies, followers of Jesus don't always see eye to eye. We disagree. And I'm not talking about disagreements around the core tenets of the Christian faith like the authority of scripture, the sinfulness of human beings, the atonement of the cross, the resurrection of the body, or the lordship of Jesus. Christians have always held these to be true across vastly different cultural and political context. What we tend to disagree on in our context is how to apply those truths to the political discussions and decisions in our day. But rather than try to spend the next few moments trying to walk through each point of possible disagreement and then debate which side is more biblical, I want to talk about the posture that I see so many of my brothers and sisters in Christ taking when it comes to political discussions. Both sides of the political spectrum tend to take the same basic posture when it comes to tax reform or health care or foreign policy, both sides hold the same basic conviction that our side is the right side. Our view is the right view. Our way of arranging the bedroom furniture for our society is the right one. And not only that, both sides tend to surround themselves with voices that reinforce their political convictions. For example, We tend to choose our media sources based on on how they lean politically. In fact, 
over half of evangelical Christians say that they trust the news more if it's delivered by people who have similar political beliefs. Over half say that. Social media is another example. Did you know that what shows up in your feed isn't based on its objectivity, it's based on complex algorithms that can actually determine your political preferences and then share information that reinforces what you already think. Why? So you're more likely to click on it. And not only are we becoming more politically segregated in terms of the media we consume, we are becoming more politically segregated in terms of the relationships we have. In fact, Fewer and fewer people today live in communities or have friendships with people who vote differently than they do. And more and more Americans today are living in counties that are not just red or blue, but are overwhelmingly red or blue. Quick example, in 1992, the presidential election, only 3% of the counties in this country were what's called landslide counties. That means the counties were decided by over 50 percentage points. It was a landslide, 3% in 1992. In 2016, 38% of the counties in this country were landslide counties. You see, people are actually migrating to communities that fit their political leaning. Republicans want to live near Republicans. Democrats want to live near Democrats. And all that is to say, we are all living not just in a hyper-politicized context, but a hyper-polarized and hyper partisan context where instead of having an ongoing dialogue about what's, about what's best for our communities and our cities and our nation, instead of people coming together as the prophet Jeremiah said to seek the peace and prosperity of our cities, we have let ourselves become tribalized according to our political viewpoints. Both sides believing they are morally superior, both sides viewing the people that disagree with them not as human beings who deserve to be loved, but often as political caricatures who deserve to be despised. And both sides, get this, both sides are convinced we're right. And by the way, I'm not just pointing the finger at you, I do this too. It's a part of my heart that so, is so easily tempted to say, I just can't stand people who think that way or act that way or vote that way. Why? Because I'm so confident that I'm right. To which Jesus would say, you can be right and still be wrong. You can have all the answers and still miss the point. You can know the deepest truths of the universe and still not get it if you don't have love. One of my favorite pictures of this in the Bible comes from the Apostle Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth. Now, if you've been to a wedding, there's a good chance you've heard this text before because they appear, these words appear in about 95% of all weddings. And because of that, many of us have kind of a greeting card view of this text as if it was written for starry-eyed lovers who are madly in love. But the context of this passage tells a different story. In the previous chapter, Paul addresses divisions in the church. Some people were claiming to be more important based on their knowledge or their gifting. And in the following chapter, Paul addresses the way people are using the church to show off their knowledge rather than help other people. Which means Paul wasn't writing the words I'm about to read to a young couple in love. He was writing to Christians who were divided, resentful, stubborn, and self-righteous. He was writing to people who were convinced the main goal of life is to be right. So this isn't as much a wedding day text as it is an election day text. So let's look together at what Paul says. This is from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, starting in verse one. Some of you know these words. Paul says, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Anybody remember what a clanging cymbal sounds like? Something like this. I don't know what that sounds like through the screen, but that's pretty loud in here. So let's just run a little experiment. Let's just say um, this is part of what Paul would mean if he were writing for today. If I were to open my mouth or post on social media and share my political views, even if my views are the right views, even if I use the most eloquent words, even if I say something that's biblically and perfectly accurate, if I don't have love, if I lack compassion, This is what I sound like. Let's just try a few examples. Donald Trump should be president because... Or to be an equal opportunity offender, Joe Biden should be president because... 
Or maybe this one, Amy Coney Barrett should be confirmed because. Or how about this one? Obamacare should be protected because. Now question, does that sound make you want to lean in and play, pay closer attention? Does that sound make you want to change your mind and live your life in a new way? Of course not. You know what that sound does? It makes me think I need to be even louder, which makes you try to be even louder. And at the end of the day, end of the day guess what we've created? A whole bunch of noise. Because you can be right and still be wrong. But Paul is just getting started. Look at what he says next. Look at verse two. He says, if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. Now, quick exercise. I want you to look around the room wherever you are for just a moment, whoever you're with, and I want you to raise your hand right now if you think you're the smartest person in the room you're in. Like you know for a fact you're smarter than everyone else around you. I can promise you my three-year-old daughter would be raising her hand right now. Some of you may be by yourself and you're thinking, is this a trick question? Should I raise my hand? Like what should I do? Here's the thing, most of us are hesitant to make that claim because if, you've, if you have even a shred of self-awareness, you know how much you don't know. But in this verse, Paul's inviting you to imagine, and this is kind of a fun exercise, imagine if you were the smartest person in the room or the smartest person at your work, or the smartest person in your school. Imagine if you knew everything there is to know about every policy decision, every legislative dilemma. Imagine if you could predict exactly how this pandemic was gonna proceed so you could know exactly how to manage every last restriction. Imagine that for a second. But you don't have love. You don't act with compassion. You're unwilling to live sacrificially for others. Paul is saying that all that knowledge counts for nothing. It's useless. This is why that brilliant social media article that you found online, that one that perfectly demonstrates why your view is right, is so unlikely to change someone else's mind. Because knowledge can inform us, but it cannot transform us. That requires love. But Paul isn't finished. He's got one more thing he wants to share. Look at verse three. He says, if I give all my possessions to the poor and give my body over to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Paul is saying here, even if I live a holy and blameless life, even if I give more money to charity than everybody else, or even if I'm willing to suffer personal hardship, if I don't love, I gain nothing. Meaning I've not grown or improved my life at all. Is anyone else seeing a pattern in these verses? At the core, Paul is saying, being loving is more important than just being right. Now, that doesn't mean we should aim to be wrong or we should ignore or reject what scripture says is true. That means in our pursuit of truth, as we pour over the scriptures and seek to discern what the, what's right and what's best, the primary challenge before us is not, do I have the right answer? The primary challenge is, am I becoming a more loving person? I mean, think about it. God could have made this election season a lot more straightforward. God could have given us a book on how to vote in the 2020 election, and then I could simply read it to you, and we could all have a, a clear picture of exactly how to vote on Tuesday. We wouldn't have to fight or debate or disagree. We could sit back and fill out all those little bubbles just the way God would. And by the way, I would love that because that would make my job far less stressful. But God didn't leave us that book. He left us a book that while clear about some things like the sanctity of life or the call to care for the poor, it gives little to no instruction for how to best advocate for those th things through our current political system. Because the candidates and parties we have today and we have to choose from are built not on a single issue like caring for the poor or defending the unborn. They also include policies and perspectives on things like healthcare, 
Immigration, gun control, social security, drug policy, minimum wage, energy policy, education, tax codes, labor unions, judicial reform, campaign financing, public transportation, climate change, trade policy, foreign policy, debt spending, police reform, privacy laws, judicial appointments, and the list could go on and on and on. You see, when we sit down to decide how to vote, we will inevitably face what a pastor named David Platt calls competing injustices. One side will better advocate for justice in this area, while the other side will better advocate for justice in another area, which is why, and Eugene Cho named this for us last week, if a person asks me, Scotty, are you a Republican or a Democrat? The response I tend to give is, on which issue? Because the reality is, and some of you are not gonna wanna hear this, but neither side perfectly aligns with biblical Christianity meaning neither side fully embodies or reflects the kind of life Jesus has called us to live. Now, does that mean we shouldn't vote? No. Does that mean we shouldn't support a political party or a candidate? No. It means your party is not your final authority. It means you should be quite comfortable talking about not just what's wrong with the other side, but what's wrong with your side. It means when someone critiques your political party, you don't hear that as a criticism of you because while it may be the way you feel God has called you to engage politically this year, your party is not the answer and it doesn't have the answer, Jesus does. And here's the thing, Jesus doesn't take political sides. He didn't side with the Zealots, he didn't side with the Pharisees, he didn't side with the Romans. Pastor named Tony Evans put it this way, and you've heard me say this before, Jesus didn't come to take sides, he came to take over. And how did he take over? Not by giving his opinion, but by giving his life on a cross. For Pharisees, who were the conservatives of that day. For Sadducees, who were the religious progressives of that day. For Roman centurions, who were the law enforcement of that day. And even for that thief on the cross, who was the looter of that day. And friends, if we want to change the world, if we want to be part of the kingdom that Jesus is building, then we cannot simply settle for sharing our opinion or casting our vote. We must carry a cross. And I know, I know, it probably sounds naive, maybe even foolish to think that living humble lives of love and sacrifice and living generously towards our neighbors and even our enemies and living faithfully, regardless of what our culture says is right, could make a greater difference than the very laws of our land, but it does. How do I know? Because Jesus never wrote a law, never ran for office, never led an army, never decided on a Supreme Court case, but he changed the world. And for hundreds of years, his followers who never wrote a law and never ran for office and never led an army, never decided a Supreme Court case, they launched the fastest growing movement the world had ever seen. Millions of people came to Christ in the face of sickness, suffering, difficulty, and death, not because of the power of Caesar, but because of the love of Jesus. And that means while we should seek the peace and prosperity of our communities, our cities, and our nation, while we should humbly and faithfully engage in the political discussions and decisions of our day, the last 2,000 years of church history show that the kind of spiritual revival that I believe is possible here in our nation that can make us truly one nation under God is not the product of electing the right government, it's the product of being the right church. This afternoon, we're hosting a drive through communion service here on our Kirkland campus from 1 to 3 p.m. And you can also participate from home. We have instructions online. And it's a time to remember the love that Jesus demonstrated on that cross and to be reminded that Jesus didn't come to earth to create a politically conservative or liberal, liberal or centrist community. He came to create an entirely new kind of community that was built not on political power, but on self-giving love. And that kind of church, that kind of community confounded the world in the first century and it can confound the world again today. What do you mean there are Democrats and Republicans in your church? What do you mean you love and honor each other as people made in God's image? What do you mean you're willing to serve and sacrifice for each other? What do you mean you're willing to put their needs above your opinions? What do you mean you pray for God to bless even your enemies? 
That's the response the world should have to our way of doing politics. And the good news is that doesn't depend on who wins on Tuesday. Hard news is it depends on how you live every day. Because Jesus said, this is how the world will know that we are his disciples. It's by how we love. So here's my question for you. What's the one thing you can do this week, even this week, to grow in how you love? What's the one thing you can do to grow in how you love? Maybe a good start is just being willing to repent of any actions that may have expressed your political views but didn't point people to Jesus. Or maybe it's time to do a little less posting on social media and a little more praying. Tomorrow night at 7 p.m. we're hosting an hour of worship and prayer for our nation. And I'll be joined by leaders and pastors from around the region who want to come together and pray for God's kingdom to come this week. And just so you know, that time of prayer will be more impactful than anything that happens on November 3rd. I hope you'll join us. Maybe God is calling you to pick up your cross and make a commitment to serving others. Great place to start is our Together 4 team where you can find or share opportunities to serve right where you are. Or maybe to grow in love, you need to simply uh, come back to the foot of the cross and renew your commitment to Jesus. Maybe you just need to tell him, Jesus, it's time I put my trust in you when it comes to my future and my security. And you can say that to him right now. What's the one thing you can do to grow in love? Because here's the thing, love is never wrong. And love, it never fails. Because Jesus is never wrong and Jesus never fails and he's not going to fail this week either amen amen let's take a moment to pray Jesus you came into this world to demonstrate a new kind of power the power of self-giving love that you showed us on the cross And you called us to carry on after you in your name and for your glory. So I pray that you would empower us this week. That as we watch the election cycle unfold and as the noise and the symbols get louder and louder, that we would shine through all the noise with incredible Christ-centered love. Jesus, help us all take that one step this week to grow in how we love. Give us wisdom and vision for how to do that. God, we want to put our eyes on you right now. We look to you, even if we feel overwhelmed, even if we're uncertain, even if we're angry, even if we're afraid. Our eyes are on you. Help us see your love so that we can be your love in this world. And everybody who agreed with this prayer said, amen.